Hello everybody, welcome to Spiritual Metaphysics 101. My name is Yaakov and I'm the uh, host of the show and also a student and teacher of A Course in Miracles, which is my spiritual path. But as I've said so often, we're including other spiritual paths and teachings as well. Well, today we're going to continue from the last episode, but don't worry, there's nothing that you missed. We're going to go over it all again, but maybe in a different way and from a different slant, because we're always talking about the same thing. And here's uh, a reference to the same thing, but maybe said a little differently. And I'm reading from Choose Once Again, Selections from A Course in Miracles. Father, there is a vision which beholds all things as sinless, so that fear has gone, and where it was is love invited in. And love will come wherever it is asked. This vision is your gift. And that's what we want to know, is that we are a gift and that we are a vision of the Spirit, and that we are love, and that we are sinless, and that we are guiltless, and we are completely innocent. And where we're sinless and guiltless and innocent, we know that there's no fear. It's only when we think that we're sinful and guilty that we have fear. And this stands to reason. Uh, I mean, typically in the traditional um, religious view, when you're guilty, you're afraid of um, being punished. Well, the Course in Miracles teaches that that sense of sinfulness and guilt really uh, is a, um, a distortion, and that there is no way that we can distort the truth that we're love and light. And so we've fallen asleep and we're dreaming that we're sinful and guilty. And somehow we felt that by separating from the truth, that we would have a more specialized experience of God's love, and that we could in some way uh, have more of that which everybody was sharing, and that we, we would bring it to ourselves. I keep thinking of the Garden of Eden story where, you know, the sales pitch of the, um, the snake was, listen, if you eat of this apple from the tree of knowledge, then you will have more power. You'll be more powerful. You'll have uh, everything God has. You won't be, in some sense, second to God, the created, and He's the creator. You'll be uh, equated with the creator because you'll have all knowledge. Well, this was a, a wonderful symbolic story of the, the fall and, and how it was enticing to us. We didn't want to simply be part of all of creation. We wanted to, be, to have the same uh, knowledge and wisdom as the Creator. Then we would be above all creation. We would be special. And that was a very interesting sales pitch uh, that the snake came up with, or as we call it in A Course in Miracles, the ego. Because it's not possible to separate from the rest of creation and somehow have uh, more knowledge and more love and more light. It's all given to us. We have all of the love and the light and the wisdom. So why did we in some sense feel that we were lacking? You know, that is an unanswerable question from the point where we are a student in this course. I, I don't know. Something was triggered where we felt that all of it the wholeness and the love and the light that was given everyone at the same time and in equal amounts uh, was not enough. And hence, you know, the Garden of Eden story, the fall, and I'm sure that in other religions they, they have similar stories, that somehow the ego was born. We wanted more of uh, something so that others could have less. And do you know that that's the world of dualism that we seem to live in? Everybody has to gain at the expense of somebody else. I, I'm very taken with this idea now because the Buddhism that I study teaches a simple lifestyle where there's no more com competition at the expense of somebody else to get more of your own. Or as the Course says, there's no more dog-eat-dog, dog, uh, you know, kill or be killed. That doesn't even play into my thinking when I'm aligned with the Buddha and the Christ. Because I know that there's, I can't have more than everything I've been given. And you can't have less than everything that you've been given. And if I think that you are going to have less, 
and I'll have more. I'm cheating myself because we're one in the same. You know, this, this simplicity of lifestyle has really started to take hold for me. Um, we recently had Super Bowl weekend and you know these ads went for million dollars and, and more for 30 seconds on the air to sell stuff that the course says we don't really need and we don't really want. And the interesting thing about advertisements is that it's to generate an interest in us because it doesn't really exist. We're, you know, being sold something and um, the underlying message is that without it you're not whole and complete. Well, that was the snake's uh, sales pitch. Before you eat the apple, which I know you're going to want, you're, you really don't have everything that you're entitled to. And if you do eat this apple, then you're going to have it. Somebody else may not be able to afford it. Somebody else may not be able to drive it. I love these car ads. I mean, I used to be as um, much a, a consumer as everybody else. I, I, re I remember wanting to have a car, even as young as 15 years old. You know, that was the, the ideal. There was something lacking within me. But if I had the right car, you know, then it, the whole world opened up to me. And of course that's symbolic of the, the greater story of suffering that the Buddha uh, wanted to undo, is this insatiable need for more of what we don't really need. And as we say in 12-step, you can't get enough of what you don't really need. So somebody in the guise of a snake uh, has to then instill in you another want. I want that. And the interesting thing is that that want is a false idol, isn't it? Because what we really want, and we've always wanted, was God's love. Our Creator's light and energy and power. That's the wattage, if you will, that lights our light bulb. And everything else is a dim simulation of the true wattage that comes from the Creator who created us through that energy and that love and that light as, as himself. So it, it really was a, an insane fall from grace that could only have happened in our split mind, but it never really happened in reality. In reality, we are still one. Well, let me read a little bit more here and, and see how this develops. It says, so love will come wherever it is asked. This vision is your gift. The eyes of Christ look on a world forgiven. For, forgiveness is a symbol of the love and light here in the world. In his sight, in God's sight, are all its sins forgiven. For he sees no sin in anything he looks upon. And we want that Christ vision. We want the Buddha uh, wisdom. We want to see with no blame, as they say in the Tao, their sinlessness. And when we have the Christ's vision of sinlessness, then there is no more guilt, and there's no more projection, and there's no false idols, and there's no searching for an answer that will never be found outside of us. And we then go back to the source, which is within. And the source within is at the level of mind, the level of soul. This whole thing is a soul journey, isn't it? Everything that we've sought uh, at the material level, including relationships with other bodies, and uh, psychologically uh, taking other codependent relationships on to in some way uh, make ourselves feel better. That's all dualistic thinking. And the dualism is I'm not okay, and there's something outside of me that will magically make me okay. Idolatry. So we want to withdraw and, w and bring back the, pr the um, projection and recognize that there is within us a wholeness that we want to remember. And enlightenment is really a remembering. It's a reunification of that which was always unified. Well, let's see what else it says here. So now, let God's true perception come to me, that I may waken from the dream of sin and look within upon my sinlessness which you, God, have kept completely undefiled upon the altar to your Holy Son. 
the self with which I would identify. Let us today behold each other in the sight of Christ. How beautiful we are, how holy and how loving. Brother, come and join with me today. We save the world when we have joined, for in our vision, it becomes as holy as the light in us. And I've talked before about this uh, collaboration or joining with our brothers. It's the only way. When I go to 12-step meetings, uh, I, I know the importance of the meeting because I'm joining uh, with other spiritual minds who are seeking the love and the light and to undo the sense of sinfulness and know that we are innocent and guiltless. And when I read these uh, spiritual books, I'm reminded uh, that I'm to go out and seek a, a sangha, a community, a fellowship, a brotherhood, uh, a family. Even in the political world, you know, they've been talking a while ago now about it takes a village. Well, th this whole idea is certainly true. But it's not, I think, as was popular, uh, popularly understood. It doesn't take a village in the sense that we're all separate and we're going to bring together the forces. It takes a village to remember when I forget you remind me that we're already one. So th there's no uh, building of a village. There's the remembering of the villageness that we already are. That's all there is. There's a constellation, if you will, of souls, of, uh, of seemingly separate minds, but they're all one in the Christ mind. And when we remind each other, as it says in the Bible, when two or more come together in God's name, then God is there and God is present. Well, why is it two or more have to be present in God's name to remember that God is present? Why is that? Well, because that is symbolic in the classroom of Earth of adjoining, as it says in here. And when we join, how beautiful we are, and we behold each other in Christ. I can't... See, this is why sitting alone at home and meditating, or going to a cave, you know, in the Himalayas, and I guess that works for some people, but I have to be with other like-minded spirits. I really do. Now. I'm in no way uh, minimizing the importance of a, a meditation and a prayer life. And that we do in the silence by ourselves. But then that restores us, if you will, and energi energizes us to then go out and to share what we've learned. And I mentioned in the last uh, segment that the 12th step in the 12th step says the same thing. When you have a spiritual awakening, you teach this. You share it. And I think biblically it's also, uh, you know, you have uh, very most clearly what you're sharing with others. And when you withhold it from others, then it dissipates and you lose it yourself. So there, there's a, um, a symbiotic relationship, if you will. And ultimately, when we're fully enlightened, I get a sense that there's no uh, symbiotic relationship, there's only one. But at the level that we're at, maybe on this rung, each rung goes up a, a ladder of enlightenment, it looks like there's symbiotic uh, relationships. And they aren't taking from each other, they're giving. The worthy and the holy joining with the worthy and the holy. And in that recognition, uh, we, are, we are enlightening, we are enlightening the sonship we are enlightening the entirety of those that still remain asleep. But the, the worthy and the holy are recognizing the worthy and the holy. I'll give you an example. The only way to, to really truly forgive somebody is to see them as whole and complete, not as sinful and guilty. We must recognize their true uh, identity as, as sinless and guiltless. That's how you forgive somebody. They never, whereas condemnation begins from a place of that they're less than whole and worthy and so we have to in some way bestow forgiveness on them to restore them from a fallen place but none of us have fallen that is a falsity that's the illusion that the ego or the snake taught us 
You have fallen, but there's a way out of this. And here's the way you start taking rather than recognizing wholeness and completeness in everyone and in yourself. I'll give you another example. Uh, the whole idea of cultures, races, different religions, even the uh, male and female dichotomy is all an expression of a disparate uh, wholeness. It's been divisive, it's been divided, and the dualism is a false dream. That's why when we incarnate, sometimes we incarnate as a male, and then we'll incarnate as a female, we incarnate as a white, or as a red, or a yellow, or a black, because all of them are false expressions of the oneness from which it comes. So we want to go back to the true identity. And the Course has a wonderful workbook lesson that's right on point. It says, I'm not a body. I'm not a male or a female. I'm not a white or a red or a yellow or a black. I am not a body. I am free. I'm as God created me. I'm spirit. I'm his eternal, holy child, eternally, immortally. So, you know, yes, I'd say interimly, we need to take these little baby steps. And the body can be given a good purpose to communicate the oneness, to communicate the learning lessons that we need to learn. But ultimately, we know that we are not a body. We are free. Well, let's take a little bit further look at this and see how it all comes together. It says, you are as God created you, and so is every living thing you look upon, regardless of the images you see. Sounds like what we've just been talking about. What you behold as sickness and as pain, as weakness, suffering, and loss is but temptation to perceive yourself defenseless and in hell. Yield not to this, and you will see all pain in every form, wherever it occurs, but disappear as mists from the sun. A miracle has come to heal God's Son and close the door upon his dreams of weakness, opening the way to his salvation and release. Well, one of the ways that I've experienced some of this recently is a letting go of the importance of my identity uh, as Yaakov. Uh, I certainly express myself and identify myself so that, uh, you know, I, I don't stand out and separate myself from people. I'm playing, let's say, a normal game, but I'm keeping in mind the metaphysics that we're learning. And that is that I am not truly this individuated, separate man. I am all as the creation of, from the all. Uh, and, and that is what you are. You're an expression not of that individuated male or female from a particular country and in a culture. You're, you are an expression of the all, from the all, the ineffable, the all, the be all, and the end all. We, we are either that or separation is true, and that we've separated and, and we are individual egos and bodies, and it can't be true. Why do I say that? Because there's no peace and serenity in that uh, dream. The only peace and serenity that exists is, is recognizing that we are the all from the all, and we let go of our individual state of mind and we keep the metaphysics and the spirituality uh, in the forefront of our minds all the time. The Christians say, pray unceasingly. The Buddhists say, you're a, a lotus becoming. And when you're the Buddha, you recognize, they say, when you see the Buddha coming down the road, kill it. And what that means, I think, in, in regards to what we're talking about is it couldn't be separate from you. How could you be going down the road and seeing a separate Buddha? The Buddha is the all from the all, and we are all from the all. So you want to kill the idea of dualism. You want to kill the idea of separation. You want to kill the idea of sin over there and the face of innocence and sinlessness over here. I'm okay, that person is, sin is sinful. It has to stop, and it stops with you. And it stops with me because we're the all from the all. I think Gandhi, you know, had, and Martin Luther King, and some of the other, uh, you know, more modern figures, 
uh, who, were, who were so enlightened recognized that the only way out of the suffering and the, the sense of fear was through love. And it was a tremendous risk in the eyes of the world. How could they risk, you know, taking on the whole British army in India uh, from a place of love? But what they recognized is it was love meeting itself and it's all from the all. And that then dispels the darkness. I'm so, um, you know, attuned now to this metaphysics that we're, we're learning that it's, it's very hard to take the news seriously. It has to be a, uh, a falsity. There, the darkness it cannot be true. Only the light exists. And consequently, as A Course in Miracles says, the more we wake up, the less we suffer. And it's a happier dream. Granted, I'm still thinking and dreaming that I'm here, but it's a much happier dream. And I don't seem to be attracted to the, uh, the media which promotes the darkness. I don't ha I, I'm not attracted to the, um, the false idols which used to call out to me, and they're false. So they used to call out to me as, you know, t bow down to me and you will know peace and love and serenity and you will know oneness with uh, what you are. It never happened in a car that I bought. It never happened in a meal that I ate. It never happened in a relationship that I in some way tried to make happen because I wanted the love that I didn't recognize was within me. There's nothing at a idolatry level that can provide us for that. So again, we have to keep the metaphysics and the prayer and the light and the love very much in mind. And this practice results in a purification so that the more we practice, the more we're purified. I said in an earlier episode, we're cleaning this window where the love and the light comes in because we all live in God's mansion. So the mansion has all of these rooms and it has all of these windows. And the window that we look through and the room that we think we live in has to be cleaned and purified. And then we recognize that we are the mansion and that everybody else is the mansion and that there was no separation of rooms or windows or any thoughts. There was only one thought and that was love, and that's all that there ever was. So everything else was a dream. But in the interim, we do have a happier dream when we keep the, uh, the Christ and the Buddha and the Tao in mind. Because we don't know how as egos uh, purifying. After the ego is completely transcended and purified, then we know. And as I had said, I think in the last episode, uh, when we don't understand, things are as they are. And when we understand, things are as they are. So the only difference was that we went from not understanding to understanding, and then we recognize the things as they are. And I think it would be most proper to say that there's only one and no, no two things. There's only one. And that is the unification in heaven. So reading a little further from Selections, A Course in Miracles, uh, it says, what can my function be but to accept the word of God, who has created me for what I am and will forever be? So I'm acknowledging my function. That's my purpose every day when I get up. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to get up, isn't it? And I, and, and I, I recognize that because then I am um, forgetting my purpose. But as soon as I remember and I've trained myself now every morning to remember that what can my function be but to accept the Word of God today, who has created me for what I am and will forever be. And then I get up. And then I get up true to my purpose. And I have, then the day unfolds for me consistent with what I had stated at the outset. What is my function but to accept the Word of God today? So everyone that I meet, is an opportunity to see them as what God created. Uh, everything that I say, everything that I, I think, 
is consistent with accepting the Word of God. That is not uh, a zealot. That is a realist. That is realism in its truest sense. Everything uh, is consistent with the Word of God. So we want to complete this uh, selections from A Course in Miracles with this reading. It says, In peace I was created, and in peace do I remain. It is not given me to change myself. How merciful is God, my Father, that when He created me, He gave me peace forever. Now I ask but to be what I am. And can this be denied me when it is forever me, and it is it forever true? Father, I seek the peace you gave as mine in my creation. What was given then must be here now, for my creation was apart from time and still remains beyond all change. The peace in which your Son was born into your mind is shining there unchanged. I am as you created me. I need but call on you to find the peace you gave. It is your will that gave it to your Son. Your peace surrounds me, Father. Where I go, your peace goes there with me. It sheds its light on everyone I meet. I bring it to the desolate and lonely and afraid. I give your peace to those who suffer pain or grieve for loss or think they are bereft of hope and happiness. Send them to me, my Father. Let me bring your peace with me, for I would save your Son, as is your will, that I may come to recognize myself. And this is the peace that passes all understanding. And I will step back and let God lead the way to that peace in which I was created. And I share that with everybody. And I think that if I were to encapsulate this uh, segment, I would say that the collaboration is complete. I and the Christ, I and the Buddha, I and the Godhead, you and the Christ, you and the Buddha, you and the Godhead, we're all one in truth. No beginning, no end, just infinite. And so it is. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye now.